Welcome to the second lecture in Growth and Motor Behavior. And this lecture will be broken up into two parts because we have a lot of material to cover and the software that we're using to record the lectures does not really allow for videos being over 15 minutes long. Cool. So just an outline for today, we are going to define the main concepts in motor development. We're going to talk about Newell's model of constraints, and we're going to discuss some basic research design. When we're defining the main concepts, the first concept that we have to define is motor development. And motor development is the sequential, continuous, age-related process whereby movement behavior changes. And it's a continuous process of change in functional capacity, and the amount of change may vary at different points in the lifespan. So we can see that motor development is how we change our movements as we progress throughout our lifespan. Some characteristics of motor development is that it's sequential, age-related, and continuous. One step leads to another, and development is related to, but not entirely dependent on age. Development can be faster or slower at different times. And the rate of development is different for individuals, meaning that there is variability in between people. And there's also variability at different times in our age lifespan. Some other related areas of study that contribute to motor development are motor behavior and motor control. Motor behavior is defined as relatively permanent gains in motor skill capability associated with practice or experience. And motor control are the neural, physical, and behavioral aspects of movement. So we go back to the definition of motor development in relation to motor behavior and control. Motor development is how our motor behavior and motor control change across a lifespan. Some other related terms that we need to know are physical growth, which is the quantitative increase in size or body mass. Physical maturation is progress towards physical maturity. So this is qualitative advances in biological makeup. So in order to really distinguish between the two, we think of physical growth as an increase in height or weight or body circumference, and physical maturation is how our hormones change and more of the qualitative aspects of how we change as we approach maturity. Meaning these would be examples like signs of puberty or the hormonal changes that take place around different times that we age. And talking about aging, aging is simply defined as the process of growing older and generally leads to a loss of adaptability and function, and eventually results in death. Coming back to motor development, one thing that we need to know is that this change is not steady. Many times there will be periods of a lot of change in motor behavior, and then there's periods where the change does not really occur as much. There's also multiple strategies that exist in order to accomplish the goal of what we're trying to do. For example, if you're a child learning how to walk, your progress is going to be really different compared to a different child, where one child can go from sitting to crawling to walking. Another child could skip the crawling stage entirely, but they still end up at the walking stage. And this use of multiple strategies really accounts for the individual differences in motor development that exist. So since there is an individuality and there is also a lot of variability, we say that there is a paradox in motor development. As individuals in a species show a great similarity in development, but there's also a lot of variability in that each individual's motor behavior is different and their path of development is very different as well. Some more characteristics. Motor development really depends on a lot of the underlying processes that are taking place in the body. 
and the change is a result of the interaction within the inner individual and the change between the individual and the environment. So we have two main processes taking place. We have as the individual changes and we have the individual in their environment that's also changing. And both of these factors really come together and affect the development of an individual. And a really good fundamental theory that explains how the environment and the individual and the task all interact with one another is Newell's model of constraints. And this theory is really what we use as the foundation upon which we build the rest of this course. We first need to define what a constraint is. A constraint is something that limits or discourages certain movements and facilitates or encourages other movements. So you can think of a constraint as something that guides our motor behavior in a certain direction, meaning that some behaviors are encouraged and others are discouraged, and it really helps shape the path which we take. So coming back to our diagram here, we see that there are individual constraints that can be broken down into structural and functional. We have environmental constraints, which has to do with the external environment. And we have task constraints, which are restricted to what the task is that we have to do, as well as the equipment that we use in order to perform the task. And we'll go into details on each of these and how to distinguish between the three. So an organismic or individual constraint is internal to the individual, and these are the changes that take place inside the body. Structural constraints are related to body size and structure. So these are changes in height, muscle mass, weight, that all affect a person as they undergo the aging process. An example of this is the proportion of head size to body size changes as we age. So for an infant, your head accounts for about a quarter of your body. But for an adult, we change that to your head accounts for about an eighth of the size of your body. So as your individual constraints change, you have to put less effort into trying to hold your head up when you're an adult versus when you're a child because the length of your head is much smaller compared to the rest of your body. So while there's structural constraints, there's also functional constraints. And these can be seen as behavioral. So these are psychological aspects to behavior. And some examples are motivation, attention, and desire to perform the task. And these are can be seen more as mental constraints. So Going back, covering individual constraints, we have structural, which is body size structure, and we have functional, which is more mental, psychological desire to move. The next type of constraint is the environmental constraint, and these are properties of the environment. And these are global and not task specific, and they affect different tasks differently depending on the nature of the task. And there's two main categories of environmental constraints. We go with physical, which are gravity, the surface upon which you're performing the task, and there's sociocultural, which is gender norms, cultural norms. So the environmental constraint really encompasses everything that is external to the individual that they don't necessarily have control over. So physically, it can be raining outside, your walking pattern, or your running gait is going to be different compared to when it's dry and sunny because the surface upon which you're walking is different. Socioculturally, our environment changes because we can see that different genders oftentimes end up playing different sports. And culturally, too, we can see that different cultures encourage the play of different sports. For example, American football is really not played anywhere else except for America. But if you go to England or India, you know that cricket is a primary sport that men will play. So we've just gone over environmental constraints, and now we're going to move on and talk about task constraints. And these are also external to the body, and they're related specifically to the tasks or skills that we're trying to perform. 
Task constraints include the goal of the task, the rules guiding task performance, as well as the equipment used to perform the task. So the goal of the task, for example, when you're playing tennis is to hit the ball over the net. The rules are the lines that are on the court saying whether the ball lands either in or out. And the equipment can be the type of racket that you're using, whether it's a racket that allows more power or a racket that allows for more control. So with these three constraints, we really have to keep in mind that the interaction between them is really dynamic. At different points in our lives, each of the constraints plays a bigger role in shaping our motor behavior. For example, when we're really young, the organismic constraint plays a really big role because we don't have the strength or the structure in order to perform a lot of complicated motor tasks. For different tasks, for different skills, excuse me, the task constraint oftentimes tends to play a really large role. All right, so now that we've gone over the constraints, let's do a thinking exercise. Find a skill of your choice, such as crawling, walking, reaching, biking, or any sport that you can think of, and use the constraints paradigm to list the factors that influence the skill, and then categorize them into one of the three constraint categories. We'll pause the video here, and at the start of the next video, I will pick an example to go over and we can talk about that.